And the idea is that the U.S. Dietary Guidelines for Americans was created to function as, again, guidelines for healthcare professionals, for individuals also trying to be able to implement what we would consider a diet that was sufficient to meet baseline needs. Again, these are ways in which we can design a diet to overcome a deficiency, not discussing any kind of optimization. There is not a differentiation for an aging population, which we know you had mentioned muscle protein turnover, um, whole body muscle protein turnover. You guys can listen to one of the episodes that actually I had Dr. Uh, Bob Wolf on from Arkansas. He discussed these stable isotope tracers as well as Don Lehman. It's just a way of being able to see the movement again of these amino acids in the body. But what becomes really important is that right now the dietary guidelines and the, the recommended dietary allowance, which is 0.8 grams per kg of protein, does not differentiate the quality of protein. And I think one of the reasons why I really wanted Jess to come on here is number one, she is a neutral party. Jess cares about the science and is not encumbered by the information on the internet from influencers. She is purely a scientist. Jess, is that fair to say? That's definitely fair to say. <laughs> In fact, I don't even know if Jess has an Instagram account, but nonetheless, her science is phenomenal. And when we think about what we're looking for for health outcomes, it becomes really important to recognize where the deficits are with the information that we're giving and also a pathway forward. Right now, we are hearing about um, plant-based patterns and it's really important to note that could you overcome the amino acid deficiencies that would be put into place with the minimum requirements at 0.8 grams per kg? Yes, what Jess is saying to state it very simply, is that it requires more calories and also typically more carbohydrates that ride along with these whole foods. And one thing I would um, even add to that is it takes more understanding from a nutrition education perspective, where really oftentimes a nutritional professional has to be involved to design these, these diets so that an individual, if they're consuming a lower quality protein, this is more likely a plant-based protein, they need to be consuming complementary and essential amino acids to achieve, as you said, those basic requirements. And so that's another key point that Dr. Rodriguez brought out in her paper as well, that these diets they put together and were able to achieve the modeling with were done by registered dietitians with intimate knowledge of protein quality. So to your point, absolutely, it's, it's total caloric intake has to be higher, carbohydrate intake is higher, and nutrition education has to be higher. And we're discussing protein, but as you had mentioned before, there are other nutrients that ride along and, and you had just mentioned it in passing, but there are other nutrients. Again, it's designing a diet, a full diet, which goes above and beyond protein for optimal health and preventing deficiencies. The conversation while we discuss it as protein, because protein is easy, it's a macronutrient that we eat. We don't typically think about B12, zinc, selenium, serine, creatine, a lot of these other low molecular weight molecules that ride along with these higher quality proteins. I would love for you, if you have a translatable way in which an individual is designing or deciding to reduce their animal-based products, would a use of an essential amino acid mix be helpful? Do you think that there is a place for branched chain amino acids? And if so, how would you put that into a nutrition plan? Right, right. So, so I'll preface as well. Uh, I'm not a registered dietitian, so certainly this is just my scientific opinion uh, based on the current literature, as well as just thinking about the practical application of an individual trying to build a sustainable meal pattern. Um, so with that, I, I definitely think whole foods approach 
I've heard that on your podcast before. Um, so whole foods definitely have a lot of benefits from their matrix. And what I mean by matrix is exactly what you just described. All of those micronutrients and vitamins that come along because certainly protein is not the only macronutrient and so not the, it doesn't cover the micronutrients and vitamins as well. Um, so for individuals who have the energy allowance in their diet, pursuing a whole foods approach would be most ideal. But as you mentioned, in some cases, individuals can't consume enough protein to maintain from a plant-based source to maintain that energy um, balance or that weight maintenance status. And so in that case, for an individual, and we bring this point out as well um, in this paper, as well as Dr. Rodriguez does, using an isolated plant-based um, protein powder could be one option. Freeform essential amino acids could be another option. Um, these we'd like to talk about as tools in the toolbox. I mean, and I'm not going to pivot too much to our service members right now, but there are times in the military setting where you can't eat a whole food because of the logistics. And so same thing for an individual who's jumping in the car, they're trying to get their kids to work or kids to school on time. Maybe in that case, an essential amino acid powder that they can consume on the go helps them get to that more optimal intake. So to, to, to short, have a short answer. Yes. I think they have a place, um, in the dietary pattern. And, uh, a level deeper is, do you envision integrating the essential amino acid density guidance into the existing dietary recommendations? Right. So I didn't explain the essential amino acid density score earlier, but for the listeners in short, uh, really, this was a concept to consider the grams of essential amino acids in ratio to the total caloric intake of that meal or of that food. And by doing this, you could arrive at a perspective of a greater essential amino acid content per calorie. And so then for certain foods, you could have a score. And for example, a score of above 2.2 for an entire meal would score very high, meaning that the essential amino acid ratio to calories is, is very close to even, right? Or and what's the low. max score? What's the uh, max so score? we did not propose a max score. I think that's where this concept was in its infancy. Um, certainly um, we are just trying to expand and explore of potential options. You know, we don't wanna call out a, a concern without trying to provide uh, one solution as we move forward. That that's very helpful, and you do feel that there there is certainly a place for this essential amino acid density conversation because again, unless uh, it, it's challenging, it's challenging this idea. And then the next question above and beyond. I know this isn't um, a list of our questions, but I'll, I'll just mention it that there are essential amino acids, and then there are limiting essential amino acids like leucine, lysine, and methionine, which the leucine limitations, if an individual doesn't have enough leucine, the outcome is relatively clear. Leucine is a trigger for skeletal muscle. Um, it does other things in the body, but its primary role or one of its primary roles is, again, stimulating skeletal muscle. Methionine has its own role. And um, lysine, which has a longer pool, uh, a I don't want to say half-life, but it seems like the protein turnover or the, the pools of lysine seem to last a bit longer. Would there be any issue having a lower amount of lysine? I think that that particular outcome and certain amino acid, essential amino acid outcomes maybe become tricky for us to identify in an aging population. And, and it's probably a deficiency or suboptimal intake over time. Again, this is just my theory that I'm, I'm mentioning.